Welcome to the um, the Friends of Native Art and the Bill Holmes Center uh, virtual presentations for this month of April. Um, I'm Bridget Johnson. I am the Associate Director for the Bill Holmes Center for the Study of Northwest Native Art. And I'm very excited today to have uh, Clinket artist Shadutla Ayal here with us and or actually and live in Hawaii, um, presenting from Hawaii about um, her work. Um, just a few um, uh, reminders. Uh, we are all on native land and I'm currently uh, coming to you from the Skagit, Swinomish and Stiligwamish lands uh, in Coast Salish territories and raised in Southeast Alaska. She carries her mother's uh, artist lineage of the Clinket people. Um, and I'm going to let Shaw introduce herself some more. Um, she, uh, growing up, uh, Shaw was inspired to bead, sew, sing, and dance uh, within the Clinket culture. Uh, as a, she's a graduate of the Native Arts and Culture Studies uh, with the Northwest Indian College and high honors uh, in 2001. And she's a graduate from the University of Southeast Alaska. Um, and uh, with a Bachelor in Liberal Arts, um, Anthropology and Art uh, just this last year, 2022. Congratulations. Uh, she has studied at the Institute of American Indian Arts and the Poe Cultural Center in New Mexico. And today she practices and teaches as a traditional herbalist and studies with the Herbal Academy um, in, in Clinical Studies. Uh, Shadut La now lives on Salish grounds with her husband, David Ayal of the Nisqually tribe, and you can find her beating octopus bags and jewelry, making regalia, skin sewing of moccasins and mukluk, uh, weaving of cedar bark basketry, raven's tail and chilkat loom weaving, uh, singing and dancing uh, with the Alaska Kutitya dancers, and storytelling and creating space for teachings, um, as well as being a ceremonial tattooist, foraging and making traditional medicines, and most important, having the roles as a, a mama, abuela, and wife. Uh, so I'd like to introduce to you all, Shadutla Yal. I'm here in the beautiful, beautiful territory of Hawaii celebrating an anniversary with my husband. So I bring you that aloha and thank you for having me, um, friends of Native Art. Um, with you. We keep our culture alive and being able to share that. And um, that means a lot to me as an artist. Um, as an artist living through the arts and what that means to me, um, I have been lucky enough to follow the path of being an artist. Uh, I think one of my first memories of being an artist is when we lived in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, the art teacher in junior high had uh, crumbled up a bag and threw it in the middle of the table. And he said, whoever can draw that will be an artist. And I sat there and I drew that bag for uh, a couple of breaks and through recess. And the next day I saw it on his wall and that was the first time I felt like an artist. So just wanted to share that story that everyone has an art spirit within them. Um, here is a clam basket that I had woven and it kind of brings that tale of what art means and how we all look at at art differently and is it the material or is it the shadow? Is it the depth? Is it what it's used for? Uh, carrying my mother's artistic lineage as a shrink at people means a lot to me. Um, it did, I grew up through the arts, whether it be carving or um, harvesting seaweed or how salmon was cut and put in the smoker, uh, even how a halibut was um, prepared. It was such a beautiful uh, way of living and seeing how we prepared and took care of everything. Um, I am Luchnahari because my mother, Mary Teresa, is Luchnahari. Uh, her mother, my grandmother, Jennifer Ross, is Luchnahari. She is from Gunahu Kwan. My grandfather is Eli Hanlon of Huna, Alaska. He is Wishkitan. Wishkitan is that of the eagles, and uh, Luchnahari is that of the ravens. So we go through our mother's uh, lineage. 
uh, through generations, I have been blessed to be able to uh, raise my children side by side with my mom um, through skin sewing and beading and weaving and singing in the language with song and dance. And to be able to have that within three generations was so healing for our family. Uh, we raised them and uh, did regalia and uh, got food from Alaska and fed them fish head soup. And when anything came new, my mom was always right there encouraging me to become that weaver or become that language speaker, or learning how to skin sew. Um, and she put me right to work. She was like, now that you know how to do Raven's Tail, this was in the nineties, I want you to weave me this. You need to weave for our dance group. And here's our Alaska dancers, the Kotia Dance Group of Washington State. Um, my children grew up through the dance group and they knew the songs and the meaning of the songs and it meant so much in the artwork that we adorn each other with and um, support each other, dressing each other. Um, is such a beautiful way of living um, and showing how living through the arts what that might be. So here you see all of our clans and their uh, crests and um, our leader taking us up to celebration up in Juneau, Alaska. So it was always a goal for us to bring our young ones back home, the homeland of uh, Shlinket Ani, uh, where they can sing and dance during celebration, which Sea Alaska holds biannually. Living Through the Arts with me also was a blessing to be able to work um, at Sea Alaska Heritage Institute and, and be a student at University of Southeast Alaska. There, almost simultaneously, what I was learning through anthropology, I was talking to the elders and I was reinventing some of the old things and bringing in a uh, face painting that I did here at uh, Sea Alaska Holiday Fair and then face stamping, there was a face stamp at the museum that I had seen. And so I was like, how can we create this in a way for our youth to be able to create potlatch face stamps? And here you see us playing with that in one of our classroom settings. Yeah. Um, living in Juneau um, and working for Sea Alaska and going to school at UAS, I was visited so many times by my clan brother, uh, George Ramos uh, of Yakutat. And we would always talk about the language and we talk about regalia and he would say, this is, this is the Yakutat way, you need to do it this way. And these are the Luchnahari Koho songs. And, and one of these days, one of these days, our tattoos are gonna come back. We won't have to paint them on and they won't rub off, we won't dance them off. And that was one of the startings of bringing back some of the traditional tattooing um, here we're standing in Yakutat and he's showing me a beaded bib of a white frog coming out of hibernation. The middle photo is us at a Juno celebration where he was so proud that I made a Yakutat tunic like I should be wearing. And then the third picture is um, dancing in Santa Fe. We had gone down to do some Santa Fe and I was a student at IAIA. So I was able to dance in New Mexico with them. Um, I've been really fortunate to be um, a study of museums and I grew up in Juneau and the museum there was one of my favorite places to hang out as a child. I'd spend hours and hours and hours in the museums and some summers I would have art demonstrators. And I remember this one summer, there was a carver carving totem poles. I'm about seven and I visited every day and he would bring me a lunch and he'd be like, I know your family. Um, so museums have always been a place where I could just look at everything and listen to their stories and look at the material and the colors and what kind of beads are those. And I would just be in awe. Um, here's a picture of my aunt, Mary Bennett, and I at the Burke Museum. And it's about 20 years ago. My hair was still black. <laughs> That's how long ago it was. Uh, the middle picture, uh, we went to 
Washington DC and we vis visited the beautiful museum there and that they have one of my favorite um, bibs there. It's a double headed eagle uh, from Cake, Alaska. Um, I just love visiting her. She's uh, such an inspirational. Um, the third picture is our family going to the Burke Museum and looking at um, my in-laws wedding dress and it was so so precious to be able to look at that beading and look at the way the white deer hide was treated and uh, woven with um, stitches. It was just a gorgeous place to be. Uh, studying in museums, uh, not only was my childhood playground, but as an adult too. Here, my aunt Ernestine, who taught me chill cat weaving, we went to a weavings gathering at UBC and there we spent so many days looking at old, old ancestors and I was taking pictures and I took so many pictures, UBC actually uh, paid me to be their photographer um, in, in hopes to get all those pictures and I gave them all the pictures and they saw the view as an artist and as an apprentice of chill cat weaving. One of my favorite memories uh, is that chill cat weaving gathering at UBC. Um, my daughter Raven and I went to the Portland Art Museum and we got to visit the beautiful ancestors there and uh, this picture right here is always so striking that she took of me. Um, talking to the robe and she, and she really understood that connection that I was having. Um, so I really appreciate that she turned around and took pictures of those robes. Uh, my beginning of weaving was with red and yellow cedar. Um, here I have a clam basket and seaweed basket that I did at the Institute of American Indian Arts, um, IAIA in Santa Fe. And it was actually um, a class that a friend and I had took in our math and we challenged our math class to be math in a basket and we wrote a curriculum. And I was so happy to be able to be in a, um, a college that would look at math and the circumference and the style of how you would get um, a seaweed basket and a clam basket. Uh, I continue to weave with red and yellow cedar. There's a picture of our daughter Tiffany and she's wearing a dancing cedar hat that I made um, some years ago. And the third picture is my husband and I, we had taken a weaving class and we, we chose a cedar hat and it took us about nine hours to get that hat done. Um, it was at the Hazel P. Salish hat, just beautiful. Here's a, um, a ghost base of some of my weavings of Chill Cat. This was done maybe 20 years ago in Washington State. And I wanted to show this picture of the growth of some of the weaving that I do here. The first picture I'm weaving at home, the comfort of my house. And um, I had woven and learned from my Aunt Ernestine Hanlon of Hona. And we were sending an apron back and forth and I would fly up to Hona or she'd fly down to Washington. And so there were some times that I didn't have the apron with me. And so I uh, would buy spin and I would study designs and this ghost face kept coming to my, um, my vision of wanting to weave it as a bag. And most of the time you see this ghost base on a tunic, a chill cat tunic. Um, Clarissa Rizal had invited me up to weave in Juneau, Alaska during a clan workshop. So I was able to bring it home and meet other weavers and share what I was doing. Um, and there after finishing it, it went into the hands of a dance, uh, a dancer where she brings it to life with song and dance and potlatching and she wears it so beautifully. Here's another chill cat weaving that I did. Um, maybe, I, I think it was 2013 and I named it Yehli Dach Hun Dachin Ach. Um, forgive me if I might have mispronounced that. I did take about four years at Schlinket um, and I'm still learning. Um, this is a chill cat study. I had started it 
and I showcased it at, at Swaya at the Indian Art Market in Santa Fe. And then I went to Juno when I was working um, and going to school. And I had sent it down to Washington State for their showcase uh, for the Washington, Washington State History Museum and Evergreen State College, um, where it won Best of Show. Um, I was so excited. And now it lives with the Alaska Heritage Institute at the Walter Sobolov Center. And you can see the four ermines for the, the four winters and the four winters just meant a lot for me because um, the fourth winter back home, I had learned so much um, being home and working with SHI and going to the University of South, Southeast Alaska. Here's a, a chill cat raven's tail um, apron that I had done for a friend, John Allman. And he really wanted something that um, showcased uh, old dyeing methods um, for birch bark and copper, uh, which I had learned from Terry Watford of Sitka, Alaska. Uh, he was a golfer, so he really wanted um, some golf tees uh, put in it and also um, uh, what it would feel like to be able to win some golf tournaments. Him and his father had traveled all, all over the world playing golf. Um, I did make it a dance gathering waist apron so you can actually pull from the waist um, apron from the top and collect um, Hudson Bay tea, uh, Devil's Club, you can put some cough drops in there because as dancers we really need cough drops every once in a while when we're singing and dancing. Um, here is Samantha Williams just beautifully dancing this. She dances this um, waist apron so well and has honored me sharing this picture. Under Mount St. Elias, Yakutat, Alaska. Uh, when I was going to UAS, this was one of my classes and I documented um, this design, uh, when it's on the loom, it looks upside down, but when the dancer wears it, it's flipped. And you can see, I, I gave it the Mount St. Elias um, mountain, and then the, there's the water and the glacier. Um, and Shaku Ish of Yakutat dances this. I gifted it to him, uh, one of my, um, ways of living through the art is being able to provide for some of our dancers. One of the important things that my mother embedded into me, she was just like, now that you know how to weave, we need to wear it. Um, there was a time when the Mount St. Elias headband and the gathering bake were together and I was down in Seattle, uh, the Seattle um, Center and I showcased it there. It was uh, the spirit walk that Seattle Indian Health Board puts together and uh, the Kotia dance scooters. We dance that every year. Um, when I was telling you, my mom would say, um, weave this or weave that. She was really serious about it. Um, these are some, she called them sways and um, I wish I knew the Shlinket name for them, but they're woven. And these are woven in raven's tail. And at the end, they're um, weighed down with abalone shell. And when a dancer dances, it's, it sways, she would say, it um, wipes the tears away. It wipes the tears away. And she said, I want this done in raven's tail. And so I stayed up one night and I wove one side and I'm like, like this? And she goes, yeah, now I need another one. Uh, Years later, um, during my capstone, I decided to have this grow a little bit more and I designed it and wove it in shell cap. And um, the idea is to put that on my um, son's headband and to get a curriculum going so others can weave it as well. Um, in childhood, uh, growing up in Hona and Juno, I often uh, drew designs for my aunties. A lot of my aunties beaded moccasin tops and um, it would be flowers and ravens and eagles and seaweed patterns. And today I continue drawing them. I 
don't veer too much away from the traditional way. Every once in a while, I'll do something really fun and like make the huckleberries like realistic, but I really love keeping the old designs. Um, the frog design that you have, that I have right here, that's the newer one that I had done, uh, a play off of the traditional. And I have these as seal and sea otter skin sewing. Here I have a Chilkat and Raven's Tail weaving. I call this Shlakutsi Shawet, which is Wonder Woman. Uh, it was showcased at a show at Evergreen State College. It went to the fashion show at um, Silas Heritage Institute. And then I had done some, when I do moccasins and mucklucks, I save all the little pieces. And so what you're seeing uh, me standing by at the Tacoma Art show is all the little remnants of the seal and I had um, sewn them so they would be like an armor and uh, in full attire of Fakutsi Shawet is worn by Hola'a and she has the weaving and the skin sewing and she wears it so well. Um, as teenagers she went to Desert Storm um, so she is she is a warrior woman. Uh, living through the arts, I really like that, the anti-vibes that I want to uh, give out to all of our youth um, and beating and sewing for them are so important for me. Here is Sovereign. She's wearing, or she has on um, some mittens. It has seal on it and moose hide has been beaded uh, with forget-me-nots. Uh, she's so cute. And she went up north and was using those. Here I have a killer whale in the process of beating um, the four seasons. And this killer whale went on Davy's tunic, who is with the Alaska Cotilla dancers. Love you guys. So this is just, I wanted to show you just the chaos of my inspiration and my beading. I always call it a, a bead garden because I always have so many projects and not enough beads, but beads everywhere. Uh, here we have Davy's uh, killer whale that I just showed you. Um, in the middle, these are some medicine pouches. Both of these were actually um, beaded here in Hawaii a couple of years ago and they have such beautiful flowers here that I love to bead flowers or uh, I bead a, an octopus bag here once in Hawaii. This is such a fun place to come and be with the water and, and bead on the beach. Um, the four seasons that you see on the, th the third picture is uh, the pocket uh, that will talk about later on. Just wanted to spotlight that for a minute. So when I beat, I always wonder where it's going to go to. Um, I'm so lucky that a lot of my friends and mentors and clan sisters and best friends always keep, keep in touch and watch what I'm doing and support me as an artist and, and encourage me when they wear what I work on. It really empowers my artistic um, ability just to press on more or to make more. And they look so beautiful and they're just so powerful um, to see it go into to their world of living and uh, going to meetings and potlatches. And they're just, they, bring such beauty to uh, our culture and our way of life. So beating for the occasion, um, here we have some uh, bear paws. My uh, husband was so blessed to be able to go into the Take Weighty clan. Uh, thank you, Mama Bear and Sister Bear and Brother Bear for bringing in my husband as a Take Weighty. Um, so here is his bear claws and in the middle of the claws is a coho, which is my clan and uh, my husband Nisqually and their uh, fish fighters, the rights to fishing has, is so strong in their uh, cultural background. Um, so my, my uncle dad said, you're in good hands, honey, because they fight and they protect the fish. Um, 
the coho. So I really wanted to put that in his uh, vest and he wore, I completed it and he wore it to be sworn in um, for tribal council. A uh, beating for the occasion. Here's Sovereign who was wearing the uh, moose hide beaded forget-me-nots. She's grown. And here she's wearing a woman's ceremonial waistband and cuff and earrings. And she took that down to the Emmys with her and wore that. And her and I got to play around and kind of design what we want wanted it to look like. And um, all my beading uh, is inspired by old pieces. Uh, when I was at the Burke Museum studying the octopus bag with my aunt, Mary Bennett, that really uh, changed the way I looked at some of the beading that I had grown up beading and drawing. So I really wanted to pull some of the older designs into her uh, collection. So here's a storyline of uh, chill cat weaving. Uh, I was lucky enough to join Patreon with Lily Hope um, and have learned so much. And she always says, continue learning and learn from many different people. And I just love that perspective. Um, I wove um, for the last year with her. We uh, started a baby chill cat robe and the top picture, first picture, you have the yellow cedar, the boiled yellow prepped cedar, and then the wool and what that looks like together after thigh spinning. There's a picture of me designing the baby chill cat robe. Uh, one of my first mentors of uh, designing was Odin Longing, who is Tlingit. I've took some lessons from Steve Brown over the last 20 years down here in Washington. Um, so I'm still learning and will continue learning that chill cat designing. My Aunt Ernestine had me design one of her headbands of a beaver for her husband. So it was nice to be able to see some of the um, design come to life. I did draw this one um, and it kind of moved towards um, being specialized of a clan and I'll tell that story in a little bit. Um, up above, you see all the raw wool that I have laid out on the table to be thigh spun. Funny story is my, uh, our little bird flew over it and all that wool just went whisping away after I had laid it all nicely. Um, but there's a picture of uh, 250 yards thigh spun, a couple weeks of work. And then the favorite part is setting up that loom and starting that weaving. So much work to get to that point. Uh, with uh, Patreon, we flew up to Alaska. Um, I brought our daughter Raven with us and she sat right next to me and wove with me. It was such a beautiful time. It was two weeks of finishing the robe. Uh, the picture of where we are sitting weaving together is about where I was when I brought it up. Um, my goal for weaving this and as you can see from that picture or these pictures, there's a coho in the middle. I really started to specialize it for my friend, um, my niece, Katsin, who is my opposite. And um, she, she's expecting, she should be delivering any day. And this was also for her and her daughter. Uh, there's a picture of me with it finished and you see the claws. I made it more bear-like and in the middle is a coho and the two profile faces is a boy and a girl because she will be having, a, she'll have her boy and a girl be dancing it. Um, I was so blessed to be with the Patreon and learn and be side by side with so many different weavers and um, support each other and lean on each other and build a friendship throughout the year. Um, we brought our robes up and finished them um, with Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. Um, they brought us in and uh, pulled everyone together and the children got to dance the robes. It was beautiful. So the Chilkat regalia woven in the lineage of Jenny Shanat and Clar Clarissa Rizal. Um, the first pictures are Sydney's. In the middle, uh, you can see 
uh, cutscenes robe there in the back. And for our children, there's a picture of all the weavers as well. Um, the, the last picture is a signature. I didn't do so much for myself. I did it in the shape of a heart. And I did that signature for all the beaters, all the beaters throughout the years that have um, caught me beating and all the beaters that dressed our children in moccasins throughout the years and all the aunties with ANS, Alaska Native Sisterhood. I really wanted to, to bring that um, for the dedication. So this is uh, one of my favorite moments of the two weeks up in Alaska and that was seeing uh, Juliet and uh, her mom receive the robe. And here Juliet um, is dancing the robe and it wasn't even finished for the dance. I still had to do the fur on the top and then the overlay fringe at the bottom. Um, I did make it very whimsical um, the side braids has uh, yellow and blue fringe on it as well. I just love this picture. All of these pictures, she's so sweet. Uh, ceremonial tattooing, I do a skin poke and um, I haven't, um, uh, professionally, I've, I, I only uh, skin poke through trade um, and it's usually at home and we usually have a full meaning of it, uh, the meaning, the ceremony, um, bringing in some tea and food and talking about the ancestors and what the tattooing means to them and bringing in their clans. Um, here are my opposites of a bear and a uh, shark wish ketan. Um, ceremonial tattooing for family. Uh, this is uh, Kola'a, uh, the one that wore the Wonder Woman outfit that I had um, woven and skin sewed. And she did a beautiful tattooing and she really wanted to bring a red, which was power for her and protection and honoring her traditions and her family. And in this ceremony, we brought in her grandmother and her mom and all the, um, all those yet to be born to be with her and um, be within the ceremony. Uh, the living through the arts, traditional tattooing, uh, women's chin tattoos are one of the strongest um, tattoos that I do within the ceremony um, long ago, this was a big part of our life, um, becoming of an age or like Hula, uh, putting on her warrior fierceness um, or being a healer. There's so many stories that I hear when they come to me wanting this done. And it's usually their, their stories or their reasoning. And I'm so honored to be able to provide that culturally. Um, when we used to dance long ago, the, the top picture is my daughter Kayla and I, and we would paint our uh, face painting. And she had posted this on social media. Someone had asked, if it was her Maori heritage and she explained to, to them that it was her Klinka heritage from Southeast Alaska. Although Maori culture is very beautiful. And that's something, even when we did the face painting, that's something that we would have to, or we found ourselves explaining. And um, she does such a beautiful job of explaining. Uh, we went to visit with her and our, we do have a family tattooist, uh, Samantha. She's amazing. Uh, she's done so many tattoos for Kayla and I. Um, Kayla really wanted Sam to tattoo her chin and I was there to pay witness. And there's a beautiful picture of Kayla with her finished tattoo. Um, and then what 
she has on her hands, uh, Samantha did as well. And they've spent many hours together in supporting each other. I did want to bring to life and breath on my presentation. Um, I am, I was born in Mexico City and I am half Mexican. Um, and I have been blessed to be in ceremony with my Mexica family. Uh, here's Raven and I. Um, and one of the things that I did with our Mexica family is I would do the face paintings. And so here you have uh, a chin tattoo and these uh, painted on, these two would have been tattooed. Um, it's just such a beautiful ceremony to be able to um, provide this for dancers and singers and have it during ceremony. And one of my favorite ceremonies was a water ceremony. And I remember it was a drought and we went down to Oregon. And after we had the water ceremony, all, it just rained so hard and everyone was like, ah. <laughs> This is a, a Raven family that I have been so uh, connected with. I uh, did a chin tattoo and on the other side, it shows uh, the wrist tattoos that I had done for them. And for this family, this Raven family, it brought them together as sisters. And there's so many deep me meanings to the wrist tattoos for them. My husband and I drove up north to be with them and I stayed up all night tattooing their wrists. And it was, it was such a pleasure to be with them and to see three sisters um, share a meal and take care of each other and, and uh, share stories and laugh and cry. And for me to be just a part of it, I felt very blessed. Um, Tattoo ceremonies is a growth. And here uh, I started out with the dots of the eye and the chin and she loved it and she lived with it and she worked with it and she became a part of it. And she really expressed how she felt like she grew and she became stronger and she really loved the, the meaning behind, uh, behind the the markings and she's like, I'm ready for the next step. So about a year later, we added the lines of both sides of her eye templates and then uh, her chin. And um, I don't do traditional uh, like payments. I lo love to do trades. So all of my tattoos are that of trades and she's an herbalist and she brought me plants and I still have the tobacco seeds from three years ago and I still plant them. Um, and all of the plants fed us that uh, fall. It was just a beautiful trade. What I'm doing now. So when I was in Juneau, I visited my favorite playground, the museum, and I brought some friends with me. And as I was taking some pictures, on my phone, she took a picture of me taking the phone and notice behind me. I was just so in love with uh, the pieces in there. And I do feel like it still is a playground. Um, so what I'm gonna show you is some videos that I took and with them simultaneously playing, that's what it feels like in my mind when I'm just so excited to visit the ancestors. And this uh, particular robe is a, a cut up chill cat um, and it has pieces in it. And as a weaver studying those pieces are so crucial for me. There she is. And you could see the stitchings that they had done to put it together on this particular wool blanket. It's just so beautiful, so fine.
I, um, since this visit, I keep calling her uh, potlatch face and she was in half and I drew her and redrew her and redrew her and I flipped it on the other side and, and completed the, the face of what she would have looked like um, when she was first woven before she was cut into in for a potlatch. And here is, I don't know if you could see that. Her full face. And in the full face, I, I still kept the stitchings. <clears throat> so the beauty of our ancestors, um, there's her and her beauty at the museum. And there, with the, with the uh, measurement of my hand, I was able to guess she's about 10 inches. Um, and here's the starting of, of the potlatch face. Uh, when we were at the museum, my husband was with me and Elaine had pulled one drawer out, but before she did, I saw the vibrancy of all the colors. I'm like, oh my gosh, is this the Salish robe? And she uh, had told us there was a, a Salish robe that we would be interested in seeing, and boy, were we. Um, my husband's people are Salish and they're Salish weaving. Um, I've been studying Salish weaving and admiring for so long. And I really wanted to bring that to my loom without it being Salish weaving, but um, that of Raven's tail. And so there's the starting of a Raven's tail legging. Um, it has the ancestors and then a transitional um, design, which is that of Raven's tail. And then in the middle, chill cat. And then you see the chill cat circles. Uh, the reason why I, or, how I justify that I did bring in the Salish is the color, um, some of this vibrancy color I put into my weaving and we're calling it the Huckleberry Dancer. It's that of purple and pink. And I'm so excited to get that one uh, done and finished. This one is one of my favorite posts of Kayla again. And uh, Kayla is an amazing artist. She's a silversmith. And she said uh, on her little post, she said, that artist life, it's in my blood. And this is literally her growing up uh, with me selling my baskets and uh, farm line and weavings and jewelry. Um, and then down below is her and I at AFN and we had a table side by side. So that was really fun. And then the middle is with Raven. Raven is an amazing smith silversmith and beater and thigh spinner. Um, so being able to, to do this um, as a family is so important. The third picture is my husband and I, and we are at the Evergreen State College uh, um, in the spirit. And this is where I brought my capstone work, the sada'at, the beaded collar. And that will bring us to the story, the process of the beaded collar that is at the Burke Museum. And um, this was one of the passions that I had for quite a while. Um, I've seen it in so many old books. I've talked about it with George Ramos. Um, I have a friend who dances one and who had inherited one. Uh, and, uh, just recently, like a year and a half ago, she sent me pictures of what it looked like. And then I have some cousins up in Anchorage who dance, um, dance some. And this is a video I had taken and sent it up to a, a friend. And I was kind of explaining how you would fold it and make it into a pocket um, and how the measurements of the collar would fit. And you could have three pockets or four pockets. There's a couple of um, prototypes that I had done and the three fit really well. Um, the last picture is the, the chill cat weaving um, and then the beading. So I'll have many projects going on at the same time. And 
one of the things I had going on before the capstone was the math class that I that um, held me at bay of graduating for so long. And I think joining Patreon with Lily Hope and the other weavers and doing a, a capstone with the artwork really walked me through some of my math problems that I was having. Uh, going full circle, there's my Aunt Mary and I at the Burke Museum studying together. Um, and when they had bought it at the In the Spirit, there's my face so excited about um, having that at the Burke Museum. Um, and my grandson Oliver came with me. And so he got to experience the full circle of seeing me beat it and coming down to the Burke. Um, here's a video of me talking about it with um, some family. One of my projects that I've been working on is that collar. Um, and I've been doing little little pockets. I don't think the volume is little on. Little pockets. And then I'm in the process of doing. The, I'm sorry, I don't think the volume is oh, on. It's on. I can hear it. Okay. And trying to figure out the bias, um, the edging on that. That's what I've been doing. I'm like trying to tally how many hours it takes. And this is my little box. And I found some pretty small beads to go with it to make the curves a little bit easier. But gosh, I wish I could go to the museum and see that. Um, the next thing I want to figure out is the cotton, what cotton to put in the back. Have a good day. Merci, Han. I, I take videos or pictures so I can uh, send them to family and correspond with other beaters and uh, my mentors uh, through UAF and UAS and other artists. And I'm like so excited about everything. But one of my goals is to build curriculum on how to make moccasins, octopus bags, um, dance collars. Um, aprons. So as I sent this, it was fun to get some feedback on it and uh, the importance of it needing to, needing to be a pocket and what that pocket was for. Did you put money in it? Did you put medicine in it? And we just have long conversations. And my favorite ones would spring back. And that was with George Ramos. And he would be saying, you just need to make it. You just need to make it. And so one of the reasons that I continue to make beautiful things that are at the museums are in old books. Uh, so my historical to my inspiration, uh, here's an old archive photo of another Luch Nahari and he's holding an octopus bag and a bib, but what he's wearing is also the beaded uh, neck shield. Um, so those are some of the pictures that I would pull from and then uh, talking with George Ramos and um, hearing from him of what things would look like and what colors. Um, see if this video will play. You see the octopus tabs where the two connect, where you tie it. The pockets have the octopus tab feel to it as well. And they did make it as a pocket. So you could put your potlatch coins or your medicine in there. Um, here, I was invited to the New Burke Museum to demonstrate uh, chill cat weaving. Here, I'm weaving on an octopus waist apron. Um, 
I just want to thank the Burke Museum and Bona for inviting me and having me there to demonstrate or study with or even be invited as a dance group to sing and dance with. I thank Ganeshish for having me. I hope you enjoyed my little presentation. And I'm open up for any questions if we have time. <laughs>